Hi there, Sonia here. Welcome back to another episode of my Help I'm Artist podcast. The podcast helping artists to create with confidence, work with impact and understand the business of art. Do you find it difficult to express your true self or do you find it hard to feel good about your art? Do you struggle to find a steady flow in your creativity? Well, the chances are that you're battling perfectionism. Perfectionism is a refusal to accept any standard short of perfection. Because I'm super serious about seeing artists succeed and I want to help creatives reach their potential in their personal life and with their business goals, I need to expose this ugly giant. Perfectionism, especially in the Western world, is probably reason number one that creatives can't create. Now, I'm not a psychologist, but I am a recovering perfectionist, and I've experienced firsthand how perfectionism can stifle, block, and choke creativity. If you are a creative person, you probably know what I mean. Or you may think, this doesn't apply to me, but listen carefully, Because perfectionism has many disguises. At the end of the podcast, I will share how I started to overcome this paralyzing parasite. Let's have a look at what perfectionism looks like. You have a constant drive to make things seem or look perfect. Not because you have nothing else to do, but you can't help yourself. Whether it's the way you see the world or the way you practice your art, or the way you post things online, you're not satisfied until they are perfect. And you've mastered the art of covering up. You're your own worst critic, and you find it difficult to celebrate joy and to experience gratitude. As a result, you find it difficult to get into a creative flow, and you are often left felt uninspired, frustrated, or dissatisfied. Perfectionism is a cycle, going nowhere fast. A repetitive, obsessive cycle that causes you to be stuck in the details of what you are writing or painting or making or drawing and you lose sight of the big picture. Perfectionism hinders progress and inhibits you from moving forward. Now remember, successful art is not based on a rigid regime of rules but rather acquiring a sensitivity in finding the treasures that reveal themselves in your mistakes and having the courage to correct them. You put down your first brush stroke and you assess the relationship it has with the next brush stroke or music note or word. It is all about relationships, the relationships between colors and shapes Tones, harmonies, words or rhythms, stroke by stroke, note by note. The string of notes or words or strokes make the big picture, the painting or the song. But this requires a great flexibility, a continual correction and reordering of these pieces for the relationships to work. If you are stuck in the cycle of perfectionism, you'll never come to the point of correction. And it is the correction of the imperfect that is the very thing that gives art its soul. We learn by our mistakes and the new insights will reveal themselves. Our perfection blots out any form of originality and the very thing that makes you, you. Your art loses its passion, it loses its spontaneity. As perfectionists, we see our mistakes as the big enemy. In fear and with trepidation, we steer away from them and head towards the familiar, what we know or what we think we can do perfectly, instead of fixing the problems and reordering the mistakes and learning from it. It's when you start avoiding any risk or creative exploration that you will move further and further from your own true artist heart. But because this drive to do things perfectly can be so overwhelming, and unattainable, we find all kinds of reasons to dodge the bullet. And we procrastinate. Hmm, 
I think I just got a text message. I'm sure it's important. Let me just look at my phone one more time and then I'll get started. Oh, but wait, I really need to do the ironing. And I can't live without those shoes I saw last week. My feet deserve them. My distraction is art supplies. When I am stuck or I'm about to start a new project, I get this urge to buy art supplies. It's my distraction of choice. Anything but face that vulnerable, fearful feeling of hanging off a cliff of the unknown and thinking, am I going to be able to live up to my expectations? Are you feeling the pressure? Well, I spent hours Googling. I search high and low for stuff that will help me create. Sometimes I even hop on my bike. You know, that's how we do it in the Netherlands. And I cycle seven miles to the nearest art shop. Anything but that keeps me from working and keeps me from making mistakes. It's literally a cycle to nowhere. But why do we pursue perfectionism? Perfectionism is the propeller that drives us to strive. Audiences could even interpret this as success. But actually, it's a cover-up for fear and shame. We get applauded for all our hard work and our dedication, but actually we're overcompensating to cover up a secret. We don't want to be found out. The fear that people will discover that we are really not that talented or funny or clever drives us to perform and to pursue perfection. But to demand this perfection from ourselves is actually to deny our originality, our humanity, for we are human and we make mistakes and we learn from our mistakes. Let's face it, if you weren't making any mistakes, you would not be from this world. Imperfection is the vital and essential ingredient in art. It's like salt in bread. It is the salt that enhances all the flavors. The seed of your next work lies in the imperfection of your last work. These imperfections are your guides, your valuable, reliable, objective, non-judgmental guides to make your art. Good art is not the same as perfect art. It is simply a myth that art needs to be perfect, that art needs to be flawless. This is what makes art art. The art of the imperfect. And guess what? Audiences can relate to imperfect. Perfect really is the enemy of good. And our perfection, if not dealt with, will leave us creatively paralyzed. Great art touches the heart and exudes from a vulnerable, authentic soul. If we really want to make art that will impact our audiences, we need to get in front of the mirror preferably naked, yikes, and take a long hard look. We need to embrace and accept ourselves just the way we are, your own beautiful self. Many artists say they lack a flow in their creativity. They go to great lengths trying to find deep, original and authentic thoughts. But art is not so much about thinking things up, but it's more about getting things down getting something down on paper, down on canvas, down in sound bites. When you are thinking something up, you are straining to reach for something beyond your reach, up, out there, out there in the universe, beyond your grasp, somewhere where great art lives. But when you are putting something down, down on paper, on canvas or in notes, it costs far less energy than thinking something up. Instead of searching for the unknown, the unattainable outside of yourself, we need to start listening and trusting the voice deep down inside ourselves. Get quiet enough to listen. Get free enough to respond. Get bold enough to trust that what is coming from inside of you is truly amazing and worth listening to. Believe that there is a river down in your artist's heart that if you stay free enough, open enough, brave enough, will flow generously and give you what you need. But this takes courage. It takes faith. 
it takes an act of faith to listen to our artist's heart. Listen and expect to receive. And believe that what you receive is good. Agnes de Mille once said, Living is a form of not being sure, of not knowing what comes next or how an artist never entirely knows. We trust, we guess, we may be wrong, but we take leap after leap into the dark. In our seeing as believing society, we want proof, we want evidence, we want guarantees, and we search for safety outside of ourselves. But as artists, we get quiet and listen and trust. We can only grow when we have learned to listen and trust that still small voice that says, do this, paint this, draw here, try this, make this. Practice this in small steps. Get out your sketchbook or your notepad and write and sketch. Do it daily. Just get that river flowing. Get it out and down on paper and learn to trust that that what is inside of you is valuable and worth getting out. And don't worry about being original. Just get that creative river flowing and originality will join you. Without a doubt, it'll flow through you. Originality can't be mustered up or squeezed out or obtained by any effort. Stay as free as you can and originality will be there. If you've decided that your artist's heart is important and that it needs to be nurtured, then it's time to start to understand and listen and trust your artist's heart. Being an artist takes lots of courage. We are continually scrutinized and judged, not only by others, but also by ourselves. Imagine, you spend weeks in your studio painting a magnificent painting with vulnerable abandonment, you pour out your heart in every brushstroke and color. The painting is an expression of something that is living deep within you, and the mere fact that you've painted it has changed you forever. Pride and trepidation fill you as you meander around the gallery on opening night. You observe a couple standing in front of your painting. You see them frowning, talking to each other, and you gaze just long enough to see them give their final scowl of disapproval. This rejection hits you hard and you are blinded and miss the tear and the smile your painting brings to some of the other guests. If you are an artist and you are anything like me, then this is an all too familiar scene for you. These are the moments when we need to resist the impulse to numb ourselves or to run and hide. The word courage comes from the root word heart and as artists we need to choose to continue to live, love and work from our hearts even when we have no guarantee that we will get anything in return. Artists are some of the most critical people I know, not so much towards others but towards ourselves. The critic inside of us thrusts us forward and can even drive us to accomplish noteworthy things. But our inner critic can be a terrible guide and a cruel master. A story I heard recently really brought this home. Some forensic artists were asked to each draw two sketches of women attending a conference. Each forensic artist was assigned one woman and they had to sketch her without seeing her. Sketch her based on the description she gave of herself. The artist listened and sketched as she described her hair, the shape of her face, her facial markings and complexion. A second sketch was made but now based on the description that somebody else gave of the same woman. There was a notable difference between the two sketches. I think you can guess in which sketch the woman looked more attractive. Not only was the second sketch more beautiful, but it was also more true to life. We need to censor our inner critic. The next time the critic takes center stage, we need to ask ourselves these questions. 
Is what I'm thinking true? Is what I'm thinking beneficial? Do my thoughts help me make better art? And are my thoughts agents for improving my health and well-being? If the answer is no, then your criticism is of no value and it belongs in the trash. As artists, we spend endless hours in our studios, lost in thought, dreaming, painting, drawing, sculpting, singing and creating. We need solitude to function and often our own judgment is our only guide. As much as we need the solitude, we were also made for connection. When you are working by yourself, you can really lose the sense of the big picture. Meaningful connections can help you put your painting and your feelings into a new perspective. Perfectionism flows out of a deep sense of not feeling worthy enough. And as an artist, we can only thrive in an environment of genuine encouragement and affirmation. Allow others into your heart and into your life and let them express to you just how loved and worthy you are. For perfectionists, there's no room for learning for studying. No rough drafts. Perfectionists paint, draw and sing as if their lives depended on it. And everything they do is as if they are making their final piece. And if we do not attain this perfection, we tear up our work, we tear up our pieces, our sketches and we start again. In Julia Cameron's book, The Artist's Way, she notes that perfectionism is not a quest for the best but actually a pursuit for the worst in us. The part that tells us that nothing we do is good enough. There are some wonderful works by Leonardo da Vinci. They are quite unfinished, but still have an enormous depth. So when is an artwork finished? When do we know when to stop? I believe no artwork is ever finished. It's just stopped in an interesting place. There's a time when we need to let go. There isn't time we need to stop. It's a normal part of our creativity. I love looking at the sketches of artists. They tell me so much about the artist and their journey and their development. I recently saw sketches by Vincent van Gogh. I saw how he drew and rubbed out lines and fixed his mistakes and he made different decisions and started again. A sketch is a kind of naked truth. You can't hide under layers of paint no plastering, it's naked, it's an honest line. Or drawings I saw of Rembrandt, they were far from perfect and I could see him struggling with his perspective and with his composition. Claude Monet, the great impressionist, wrote in a letter to a friend. I am distressed, almost discouraged and fatigued to a point of feeling slightly ill. What I am doing is no good and in spite of your confidence I am very much afraid that all my efforts will all lead to nothing. Of course in retrospect we all know how that turned out for Monet. As perfectionists we set our limits at a place where we are assured of success and applause. We don't compare ourselves with the sketches of Van Gogh or Rembrandt, but we compare ourselves to their masterpieces. Anything less and we would feel vulnerable and silly and stupid and naked. Only in perfection do we feel safe. But don't be ashamed of your bad stuff. Keep all your studies. Keep all your failed canvases. They're a good reference and you can learn a lot from others, but you learn the most from yourself. Remember, in order to get to beautiful, you really need to go through the ugly, the ugly truth. Learn from it. Learn from your mistakes. Master your craft. Stay free and your pain and struggles and mistakes and defeats will lead you, will lead you to beautiful. Many artists say, but I can't do it. What you are actually saying is, I won't until I do it perfectly. You may think that perfectionists have neat, tidily, orderly homes and lives. But I talk from experience that perfectionists are some of the untidiest, messiest people on the planet. If we can't do something to perfection, 
we head off in the other direction and simply don't. As a result, we leave piles of unfinished works, words and dishes. In a delightful book by David Bayliss and Ted Orland, Art and Fear, they tell the story. At the beginning of a term, a ceramic teacher announced to his class that he was dividing them into two groups. All those to his left would be graded solely on the quantity of their work. The more work they made, the higher their score would be. The other group would be graded on the quality of their work. They would be graded by one single piece. One single pot would decide their score. At the end of the term, it was time for the pieces to be graded. The works of the highest quality were all produced by the group being graded by their quantity. The quantity group had been churning out piles of work and learning from their mistakes while the quality group had been theorizing about perfection, but in the end had little to show for it. At the beginning of the podcast, I promised to share my antidote for perfectionism. And I have good news. Perfectionism can be conquered. I used to be too ashamed to show people my unfinished paintings or designs, and if they did happen to get a peek of what I was doing, I would go to great lengths to explain that I was still working on it and that it was far from finished and that I was just sketching. In other words, what I was saying, please still like me. Please still think I'm okay, even if my art is not there yet. As my workload and the number of clients started to grow, so did the pressure to perform. This pressure was not beneficial to my creativity and I needed to get this monster of perfectionism out of the way. I decided to take my art out of the studio and onto the streets. A great exercise in conquering my fear of rejection and embracing my vulnerability. I remember going on a painting trip to Italy where I spent glorious days painting the villages and the beautiful Italian surroundings. The locals were super friendly and would shamelessly hover over my sketchbook, expressing all kinds of things with theatrical gesture. I couldn't understand a word, but I heard their hearts. They felt so honored because someone saw them and took the trouble to come to their village to paint and to paint them, no matter what the result looked like. And I just smiled and kept painting. Later I did the same in my hometown painting and drawing on the streets whenever the weather allowed it. Creative work done in a public space stirs something in people. I had conversations I otherwise never would have had. In brief meetings, people told me that they once painted or how they felt inspired and wanted to go home and do something creative. And as a bonus, I was able to share more about my work and tell them there was actually an artist living in their village. This has proven to be a great anti-serum against my perfectionism. It reminded me that my art was more than just the end product, that it was a process, and that I could share it with others while enjoying the art for myself. A group of students were challenged to solve a problem. In a room there were two pieces of string attached at opposite ends. The strings were just not long enough for them to join and the students were challenged to join the string together. On a table there were a few accessories, some tools, some tape, scissors that would aid them in joining the strings. The group was divided in two. First group was told that this was an IQ test and that they would be scored accordingly but they could not fix the problem. They couldn't join the strings. The second group were told that if they fixed the two strings together that they would get cake. And guess what? The group, the second group won and got the cake. Fear and perfectionism paralyzed the first group. So let's go for the cake. Let's celebrate. Let's play and create and celebrate. Celebrate our creativity. Celebrate the process of that we are learning and that we're on our way. Let go of perfectionism. It has nothing to do with excellence. Of course, as artists, we want to strive to make good art, to develop our skills, and communicate our ideas, our thoughts and our feelings as clearly as possible. A perfectionist writes and draws with one eye on her audience. Instead of enjoying the process, perfection is continually grading the results. So let's enjoy the process. 
while perfectionism refuses to accept anything less than perfect excellence embraces reality transforming imperfection into beauty in order to make this podcast as actionable as possible i've made this worksheet for you to download the exercises and questions will help you assess your perfectionism and will help you overcome the barriers and allow your creativity to flow you can download the worksheet on www.sonyasmallhere.com slash 003 download the worksheet today and start overcoming perfectionism thanks so much for listening and i look forward in connecting with you next time take care bye for now